Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jim Partridge, I'm a modder and mapper and I am uh, about to play through the episode 2, uh, Half-Life 2 episode 2 driving sections um, to carry on my sort of analysis of looking at the driving sections of the game uh, and uh, seeing what we can learn and seeing what I can put into my upcoming mod uh, to make it more interesting and see what works and what doesn't. So um, I'm just going to lower the game volume here in a second. That's right, that's all the way down. Right, okay. So, um, unlike Half-Life 2, we this is the first, pretty much the first section we come out into with the car. And um, you come out of uh, the Freeman Pontifex uh, chapter and straight out into this tunnel, and it brings you right out into this landscape, which is kind of different to what we've seen before in the mod. Uh, it's, it's a much bigger landscape uh, in the game. It's a much bigger landscape. And uh, you sort of snake your way back and forth uh, through these environments, and um, should have known it wouldn't be as easy as just driving down the road. Looks like we'll have to take a detour. Thank you, Alex. Um, and the thing I really liked a bit, and one, one observation I made uh, a little while ago, is the fact that in uh, the Half-Life 2 levels that I played through before, it's all tunnels, and when you transfer and find, we've just done one of those, but. You know, I think the players become used to, oh, okay, drive into a tunnel, carry on. And what they're saying is almost, nah, not this time. Now we're going to do this properly. And I think it's just because the engine was uh, capable of so much more by this point that they were able to do these really big outdoor environments and, um, and have the player really uh, explore these. But you'll see that we're sort of now we're sneaking back on ourselves. And so they're really eating as much. Uh, as much driving as possible out of a single environment which is another um, really good uh, technique so I was saying before how templating for me has been quite useful because I'm able to build a lot of environment uh, a repeating section of road over and over again that I can tweak and make it look slightly different working, we need to send a warning to White Forest they've got no idea the combines heading their way okay, Alex. Um, and another observation I had was, uh, if you remember in Half-Life 2, we had the, the Tau Cannon attached to the front. But actually, in this case, Alex is our cannon, because she can shoot things as she goes. Um, and uh, so we don't really uh, need that cannon anymore. There's not a lot going on up here. The service, as we sort of found at the beginning of Half-Life 2, this whole first section, there's not a lot of gameplay. It's really just us putting effort down and enjoying uh, driving as we head up to the radio tower um, and enjoying the vistas as well and I think when you're driving like this um, having having vistas like this is a, uh, a really good idea um, if you're eagle-eyed you can spot the hunters running along this section um, uh, as you're driving in there there's quite a lot of hints uh, all the way through episode 2 with them sort of uh, I mean earlier on in the beginning of episode 2 there's a bit where a hunter is, appears on a roof quite a long way away uh, before it stabs Alex and um, it's the sort of first introduction of them but they're all sort of creeping around the outskirts and creeping around the outside in the same way as at Half-Life 2 you had a lot of combine soldiers that would sort of run past a window or something like that in the future but they're always hinting at about what's to come and I think that's really good uh, Thanks. Um, <laughs> I, hope I, I quite like doing that. So, um, we've gated the player, but we've gated them uh, in the car, but we've gated them into quite a large area. And once again, we were talking about dead ends don't feel like dead ends if they're in quite a large space. Um, and the thing I like about this area is obviously it's designed very much with hunter behavior in mind. Uh, we're about to have a battle with hunters. And this. Uh, you know, this whole setup is, is designed to get the best out of the hunters uh, possible out of their behavior. And what I found is the best thing out of uh, hunter behavior is really figure of eight. So you can see that, you know, this building and this building, this bit in the middle is kind of creating that sort of figure of eight type uh, or, or, you know, extended figure of eight type pattern where you can do loops and move around. And we'll see how the hunter behavior really uh, comes into its own um, with that kind of layout. I wonder how long that's time before she kicks in. Um, 
So part of what I'm doing is uh, uh, in, in my mod coming up is the uh, same as in the old deep down. I, I want Alex to be talking about things and referencing them and stuff like that. And obviously, you've only got a limited amount of dialogue you can do, but you just have to be creative and get her to see if you can find some lines from her that fit the situation wherever you are. Even if it's just so much as a simple generic kind of, huh, look at that kind of thing. Uh, just remarking on what's Let's going on. For a transmitter room. Uh, so the minute you drop in, you can hear the hunters uh, making their noises. Mm -hmm. I really like this. Um, um, that's a really useful line to use whenever you you want to separate Alex from the player in your own mod. Um, it's quite. You have to constantly find excuses as to why you might want to um, get rid of Alex because unfortunately she can't do a lot of the things the player can. So lines like that are really, really useful because you can just kind of get rid of her and uh, for a little bit. Ah, okay. Um, we've done this one before. It's kind of the extension of the, the cable puzzle. I quite like this one just because it's uh, they've taken the original idea and asked you to do a little bit more lateral thinking. Um, it takes you a little while, I think, at first. You kind of look at it and go, oh, I didn't get it. Um, but then you realise that there might actually be another, uh, another thing. I've never done one of these connection puzzles in my maps. I think they're okay, but really it's just sort of the battery puzzle extended. Oh! Okay. That was clever because it knows you're going to be facing that way. No one faces the back of a lift. That's social engineering, by the way. If you ever want to freak people out, get in a lift and uh, and face the back. <laughs> um, um, but they know you're going to be facing that way. They know exactly that's what you can see. So it's almost presenting it to you, but in a very natural way. Ooh, just Here it comes. This is a great fight. I really love this. I really like how it's getting angry as well at this point as well. The drama in this level is great. Um, putting bottles on the thing here is great as well. It adds so much more kind of um, visceral, you know, um, um, Oh, Hunter's on hard. This is difficult. Right, okay. He's down. Is he down? Three. Okay. So here we've got three hunters, but um, you know they're sort of letting us out into the environment now, which has been kind of designed to, to deal with it. I'm not sure how many there are overall. There are three or four. But um, okay, let's do this properly. So the one thing that's uh, that's quite fun about hunters is their. Uh, they're kind of an, uh, an enemy that you want to keep at a distance because of that kick that they have. Um, it's uh, ooh, okay, yeah, that as well. The charge is you, you're constantly sort of fighting for space the whole time when you're fighting them. Um, and I could go on about hunters quite a lot actually because there's so much. Um, I think they're a really fantastic addition. Um, if you don't, you know, if you don't engage directly, they'll come looking for you. But they almost. Uh, they almost avoid direct confrontation. Oh, here we go. See, there's even more. Um, a bit like uh, the acid lines as well. I think Valve learned in this episode that having an enemy which doesn't uh, directly attack you is, uh, is is actually far more engaging uh, for the player. We talked about um, combine just running straight up to the player. Um, the one thing I would say that actually... Um, it's the weakness of uh, of hunters is, is physics props. Um, if you uh, if you just pump physics props at them like that, they're really quite weak. Um, like especially the car. If you pump the car around and, and slam it into them, they can die in one hit. Um, 
there was a lot going on there but let's just talk about sort of the things that i learned from this is, is you know or for, from working with hunters a bit is you know having lots of buildings that you can move through as well as around um the moment you're inside a building the hunters will start sort of moving around the outskirts looking in looking in at the player which is exactly what they're designed to do a bit like striders really i mean striders are designed to hunt down the player and the best thing you can do is put the player inside a structure with the strider on the outside um and uh that will um sort of generate Here it is. a uh okay. a feeling of being hunted even though um i mean a direct battle against a strider is fun and interesting especially with the episode one uh, aggressive behavior that was added but um, it's more fun, I think. It creates a lot more emotion, a lot more fun for the player if you're having them in a room being sort of stalked by something on the outside. And, uh, and I think hunters definitely generate that kind of feeling. <laughs> I love making some of these pretty. I'm going to finish this scene, head out, and then we'll start another, another chapter in a second, but... Um, I wonder if we got any of that. Let's get back on the road. The yeah. other thing is, uh, oh, always in the videos here, you get the uh, the advisor kicking in, and we just saw it at the end there. And that's another one, like the hunters, they're just sort of hinting at it. It's always there, just on the outskirts, always uh, sort of just appearing. Um, I think that's the crow I shot at the beginning. Um, anyway. So, yeah, this is our first kind of section. It's not even a driving section, it's a dead end. It's got a fantastic bit of story and action all tied together. And one thing, it's fantastic. They really nailed it with episode two. You took all the best bits of the rest of it. Um, Let's keep going. See if we can pick up the road somewhere ahead. I think this is an interesting point as well. Is, you know, at this point, we've gone off road. As, as Alex said, we're, you know, we're sort of forced to, to, to sort of engage with it much more. Work at environment um, and uh, for a driving section, I think that's kind of interesting. I think I think the difficult thing is is to create a driving section that doesn't feel like. I mean, this is you know we're in a canyon here. We've got kind of a a worn, almost road surface that we're driving along on the the, the texture on the base there. You can see it's kind of guiding us as if this has been you know traversed many times by other vehicles. So even though it's supposed to be off road, it's still kind of trying to make it feel natural is tough. So that's a point of no return when they're loading the next map. We're falling into the next map there, which, um, yeah, I think is it, pretty smart, especially when you've got the car, because obviously you can move very quickly and get through a lot of. Um, hey, I know that peak. Well, you can see it from White Forest. Um, <laughs> you can get through a lot of uh, map and head, you know, quite quickly. So you could spend the whole time uh, driving back and forth, but they've they've stopped us from doing that. Okay. So we got a glimpse of the rail line as we came over the hill here, and, and I mean, these this map and the map before it really pushing the boundaries as to the, the size of a map that you can do for the source engine at this time. Um, it's one of those advisor pods. Back in the citadel, those things we saw. And if you just look at the landscape, uh, we've kind of zigzagged our way back down here as well, so once again they're getting the, the best out of it. I must admit, it didn't feel like a zigzag, but it definitely was as we passed through the mountains up here. Um, and then the other nice thing about doing zigzags and tiering is that you can kind of show the player where they're going to go, where they're going to be in future, um, which they couldn't really do in, in Half-Life 2 because I just think they couldn't uh, put the maps this big together. But because in Episode 2 now you've got the ability to do this, or had the ability once they built it, it's a long time ago, um, you, can, you can break up maps make very large outdoor spaces break them up with fences like this um and create a lot of gameplay out of one large outdoor space um and i think that's um something that i'm trying to emulate um you'll notice as well that we do probably i think we can probably you know like jump forward i mean we want to make sure we hit the barn so that's probably cut off from us but I don't know, I'm sure that they've probably gated this in and made sure that we can't um, we can't get down here just yet um, because the advisor scene that we're about to go into is a uh, is very very important uh, for the story but uh, give me a minute 
Um, the other thing they did here was, you know, obviously with the vehicle they added the uh, the flashing tail lights so that you can find it again if you lose it. I mean, there was a few points back in uh, when I was playing through Half Life 2 uh, Highway 17 that I actually lost the uh, actually lost the, the lost the car. Come on, Alex, where are you? Totally lost her, where's she gone? Oh, there she is. What are you doing? Oh. I think she might have... Come in. I think she's bugged. I think we've uh, wandered off the nav path. Hmm. I, know, I do know quite a lot of players who, who revel in... Um, oh, no, she's coming. Um, who revel in trying to lose Alex all the way through this section, which I think is um, brilliant. Any time a player can come up with their own minigame uh, inside a game like this is uh, incredible. So, um, oh, here we go. So now we're starting to get the advisor effect, which is actually really hard to replicate. I tried that and it was quite painful. Um, this building here is useful, but I mean, it becomes quite um, integral to the combat in the next section. Uh, once we come out of the advisor pod uh, experience, um, and I'm just dubious as to whether my uh, my frame rate is going to be able to keep up with this for the next video or not. I think we should probably uh, cull it here, and I'll start another one once I'm finished with. Okay, we're back, and the advisor's just oh left. Um, as I say, it's a bit sluggish if I'm recording on a scene like that, so I thought I'd leave it. Okay. So, um, now we've got the player and Alex in a enclosed environment, and, uh, you know, you're in a room, you've got a locked door that you weren't able to get through, or an exit. Now, there's lots of mods I see which have locked doors that don't have the combine door lock on. The combine door lock is a very, very clear indication to the player that, you know, there is, uh, there is absolutely uh, no way of getting through that door. What's nice is, is you can have that then as a feeder door for any combine forces, um, so that um, so that basically you can bring them in whenever, whenever you're ready. So you can just blow that door lock and, and go from there. And it's quite easy to do. It's kind of just a time sprite with the sound. Um, so this battle is quite cool and actually quite difficult. Um, so they've kind of arranged themselves out. They're ready to go. And what you'll see here is, um, coming back to my point uh, I made uh, on my other video, um, you have short range, the uh, shotgun, medium range, the SMG, and at long range you see we've got the ART. And they've also brought along a, uh, a hunter just to keep them in the as well. But the point is, is that... Um, each of these NPCs is like a, a chess piece. Um, it has a specific purpose. So if you think about chess pieces, you know, the bishop can only move in a diagonal fashion. The queen is obviously, um, can move in all directions as far as she wants. Pawns can only move one square forwards. All of them have different functions and different um, abilities. And by combining those abilities together um, is how you, um, you create challenge. And so uh, here, just because these are all combined soldiers, the weapon that they have um, gives them a, a different purpose and a di they're a different piece on the game board and uh, by combining those pieces together in different combinations you can create lots of different interesting challenges uh, and create more challenge. So one thing we do see, and I've talked about this a lot I think on other videos, is, is the, um, the concept of, I'm going to pause this for a second, is the concept of using um, player uh, using too many combine soldiers to create challenge. Um, the problem is that too many combine soldiers, you know, I mean obviously you can throw 10 combine soldiers with SMGs at the player and most players are quite good now and if they've got the shotgun they can sort of strafe circle around them, pick up virtually no damage and shoot them all. Um, there, that just creates a longer sort of bit of combat. It doesn't make it any more challenging or any more interesting. Um, to make it challenging, or to me, I think you should be trying to get as much gameplay out of, uh, out of each combined soldier. But to do that, 
what you what the best thing to do is to as I say combine them into different um, squads of different types and that really gives the player a challenge because they have to use different tactics for each of those different types of soldiers and so um, uh, they're having to constantly swap out their tactics depending on uh, which, which particular soldier of the group is, is engaging with them. Um, anyway, so some ideas. So the next section uh, is something that I'm very fond of and um, isn't something that we really had in uh, Half-Life 2. It's something they added here which is a sort of a more pursuit style. I mean obviously we had it actually with the airboat and the helicopter obviously that's where the helicopter came first in so they're bringing that back in again but with the car we didn't really have a pursuit type situation um, I think the helicopter well, obviously the gunship is another one that you could use but um, I think it's uh, I think it's just fun really I mean I think there's not a huge amount of challenge to this bit but it really is cinematic and it's really good fun and um, I'm not sure the chopper's really designed to do that much damage until you get it into a, that kind of uh, combat space. Um, killing zombies with the car is fantastic fun. Um, and there's something, I've said it before in other mods, about torturing zombies um, that is very, very satisfying for the players. Um, I like this because you've got these fast zombies uh, running along the tops of the roof. And, um, Oh, and here, you know, we're sort of adding more interesting challenge here by having the player dodge things. So I think, um, obviously driving along a straight line, we already established, wow, or driving directly into the back of the train um, is fun. But um, obviously adding challenge along the way is, is the main thing. And just driving through an environment isn't particularly interesting. So we've sort of done the driving through an environment bit at the beginning to get, our, to get used to it. And now pretty much every single section that we drive through is going to have... A, uh, a particular function or, f you know, or reason and I think you can almost sort of count in seconds between the next thing to interact with in the driving sections of this game in fact you probably do it for all the game but um, and I think it's a really good thing to think about in your map is if you're building a level is you know think about how many seconds there are between um, you know one thing to interact with or one thing for the player to do versus another Oh. Everyone loves their telegraph jumps, they're great. And having Alex telegraph it as well, um, it really makes it clear what you're supposed to do. You see, that was kind of fun because the, the zombie bit um, is uh, is great because they do one thing and then they say, haha, that was fun, wasn't it? Do it again. And they kind of give you a twist on the second time around. Um, and so I've got a weird. Uh, skin for zombies on my game for some reason. They, they've got this luminous thing going on. It's not very fun. I think I was just playing around with it one day and I've lost where that skin is actually sitting and causing the zombies to shot like that. But anyway. Um, so the players sort of constantly being asked to stay on their toes. And um, There we go, and now we're into the uh, oh, into the next section of gameplay. I think what's um, really cool about that is that you're sort of, you know, you're hurtling along at top speed, and they uh, and they have you kind of career through a thing and then slam into a wall, and, and you go from sort of 100 miles an hour to 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 nothing into kind of a once again like a decompression zone between two different types of gameplay. Um, Alex. Um, and then we're into our uh, our chopper um, fight. So that was interesting. So as we dropped down, it had a uh, you know like a, a chopper bomb, and a couple of them. And there's one there that isn't detonated yet. You can pick it up and play with it, and it starts to go, and you can get rid of it. And that's a really good training, you know, piece of uh, player training that they understand how then to manipulate these bombs because we haven't seen them before this is the first time we've really encountered them apart from when they're throwing them at the car so it's really important to understand it's a physics object you can pick it up and you can throw it around and it will detonate after a, a certain amount of time this fight is uh i'm not sure how i feel about these you know we've seen quite a lot i've seen them done well and i've seen them done badly um the height of the chopper is key as well as the um you know the the sort of the, the turning circle or the amount of space it has to move around 
if you get this, I've seen it on several maps, you know, on bridges and stuff like that, which are great, and they're all fantastically done, but at the same time, the, the chop is too far away, and you can't land a hit, you know, even, it's, it shouldn't be that hard to land a hit, is the point. Wow, that was two hits on that side, I must have this on easy. That's cheeky. Anyway, but this is a, uh, an educational thing, so that's fine. Um, I really like this as well. The other thing is, um, Alex can perform multiple, you know, different functions. We've seen her in um, in Freeman Pontifax earlier on, where she's acting as a sniper. Here, she's handing out health. So, if you wanted to, uh, you can use it for that. As we talked about in an earlier video, roller mines, she can convert those into uh, into friendly uh, objects. There's so many different things that she can do, and she's a cannon in the car. She's, you know, um, that. The, the adding her into a map and using her in a map is 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 often really useful and it adds a lot more gameplay options um, for the player uh, or for the mapper in fact okay and then we are into um, this next section with the cannon uh, which I think I'm gonna play through um, because I enjoy it and uh, it's one of uh, it's one of the better areas. But I think I'm going to pause the uh, I think I'm going to pause the recording and I'll come back and go through the next section um, and let this story section play out. Okay, here we go. Um, so now we're now into the section uh, just after uh, the helicopter fight where we're heading for the auto gun and the, uh, the sort of toxic zombie area. Um, that's more of that horrible uh, skin for the zombie that I did. Um, okay, I mean, this is kind of fun. So we can't really see what's going on, but the zombies are bashing away on the other side of the door. You kind of get the uh, get the gist. You stop getting rid of these, and you're like, <laughs> and there he is. Um, so this is, uh, on my Freeman Pontifex um, level review, I, or, or um, sort of piece, I was looking at it, and there was a zombie very much like this one who was just kind of bashing away at a door and you had all the time in the world, you know, so here you are, you can look through this window, you can see fully what you're about to get yourself into. It's all hanging out there and so, you know, you've got the, um, all the time in the world to make your assessment, make your plan as to what you want to do, how you're going to deal with this situation, and then finally um, execute your plan. So I've decided that I'm going to open the door, oh, am I? I forgot how to do this. <laughs> ah, there we go. And, um, I knew I was going to use the saw blade. I didn't realise I had to uh, gravity gun that. So, you know, they've given you some stuff that you can stay in here, stay relatively safe, but pick off the zombies. You know, or if you want to dive back out there, you can do and, uh, and do what you need to do. The, uh, this is once again, you know, we get into our zombie torture. Um, Fun, fun playground. There isn't really a lot of uh, there isn't really a lot of challenge here. I, I've had several people say, "Well, I don't really do zombie levels because they aren't really challenging." It's true, but that's okay. Well, it should be okay. Go away. Um. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a, a strong argument to be made about challenge, and I think. I don't think a level has to be challenging, I think it has to be fun. And um, sometimes fun comes from something very challenging where you want to keep trying and, and succeed. And sometimes fun comes from being mean. Sometimes fun comes from, um, I don't know, just playing silly little games um, and uh, uh, that you've set up for the player to, to, to play around with. Um, I think it's okay to... Uh, play around with this stuff. I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to go. Oh, I know. It's up here, isn't it? Um, or is this just a bonus bit? Oh, no. Here we go. So then we get uh, we get to see our, our area. And we've talked about this before on other levels, which is, you know, show the player the lay of the land, first of all. Show them what they're about to get themselves into. Don't just drop them into the middle of something. Um, the more you can give them the ability to understand the geography of the area they're about to move through, the, the, you know, the the more fun they're going to have, and also the, 
the, the more it will be down to their skill and their choice as to whether they succeed or not. Um, <laughs> that's brilliant, isn't it? Um, there's so many good things, and actually what amazed me about episode 2 is just the amount of new things they managed to come up with for the zombies. Without really adding to... I mean, they added some extra animations and stuff like that, but for the most part, they just found new and uh, very intelligent ways of, of, of using what they already had. And I think that's... Um, and uh, I think what I've found is that there are lots and lots, still lots and lots of things that you can do in this game that haven't been done before. There's such a... Uh, what they've given us with the, uh, the hammer editor and, and all of the entities is really a tool set that you can make games out of and it, it's very different from lots of other games I think the only other thing that would come close is Skyrim with the uh, the, the, the creation kit oh he's shooting me, oh it's the turret um, uh, yeah the Skyrim creation kit is probably the only one of the only other um, game development uh, tools that allows you to really sort of create your own gameplay or create your own games um, most of the other uh, creation kits and stuff around are designed to for you to um, to make more of the same to make more of what's already been delivered um, I think with the, you know the really smart thing about Half-Life 2 is that there's a it's just a, a really cool kit to make different kinds of games um, and that's why I keep coming back to it and you know I've made Left 4 Dead levels, I've made Portal uh, stuff um, and I like all of those games very much I think Portal is good because you can come up with sort of new uh, new experiences but um, I think Half-Life 2 really gives you the ability to make different games every single time and by games I mean you know just changing the rules of the gameplay uh, every single time um, Left 4 Dead 2 is great but it is a very sort of defined experience um, I think it's the co-op element of, of Left 4 Dead 2 that gives you the um, the variety it's how, it's how different people play so playing with uh, playing with other players whenever possible on Left 4 Dead or Left 4 Dead 2 is always advisable because that's what really adds the, the fun I think So lots going on, um, lots of, you know, you're constantly being reminded that this cannon is, is incredibly dangerous and will, uh, you know, will kill you at a uh, given time. Um, and it, yeah, here we are with um, Combine versus Zombies and me throwing things um, at it, adding, adding to the mix. Um, the player is really just another faction, if you like. Um, Ampines, Rebels, Combine. Um, zombies and so on um, it's I think it's uh, uh, mixing those up is, is, is great I'm trying to think of I'm trying to think of a time in anywhere in, in Half-Life 2 or episode 2 episode 1 where you have more than two factions at the same time in a space fighting each other you know so you've got like uh, Zombies and ant lions and combine all together in one space. I don't think so. I think there's there's sort of ant lions versus zombies at the beginning of the mines in the, or in the mines in this one. There's zombies versus uh, combine in the uh, in the hospital in episode one. You keep looking at those combinations and just see if they, they come up with, uh, with anything. But maybe someone should do it. Okay, so this is kind of fun. I like this um, this kind of gameplay where you you sort of have the advantage, the height advantage, and you can uh, and you can really sort of take them by surprise. Um, that went a lot further than I expected. Giving the player a height advantage is um, is good. Height is a really, really powerful thing in, in first-person shooters. Um, if you give Combine the height advantage, um, it, 
creates a hell of a lot more challenge for the player. And bearing in mind we already know that the player is uh, is very good at playing this game, probably, um, giving uh, creating as much challenge for them as possible is is a good thing, as long as it's fair, that's, that's great. Um, so putting the player at a height disadvantage really does up the up the uh, up the challenge level, and I think that um, they should uh, uh, the player should always be challenged like that. I think I think the combine always deserve a healthy advantage, not by throwing hundreds of them at you, but actually giving them height advantage and also sort of a strategic advantage. So this is really subtle. Look at this. So the air is being sucked into to this space, and it's really just giving you the best player direction as to what it's like you're something is supposed to go in here you know all everything is going into this space and you know here's some grenades here's your grenade and and um if you were to put something like that in your map without that without that that air going into it i think the player might struggle to understand what it was they were supposed to do because obviously you can't see anything in it that's sort of blind. i mean obviously the 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 crate would be a good indication that there's obviously something to do with grenades because we've given you an endless supply of them. Clearly, there's an action you're supposed to take. But I still think that that it's that that subtle air airflow that really, really does that. So that was a good bit too. So they knew that we were going to come out crawling, and so why not have a zombie towering over you at that point, sort of stepping around the corner and um, not really that dangerous because. You can't really do that much damage, but certainly uh, adds to the sort of drama of the situation. So now we've taken out the uh, the cannon. You know, the, the tables have turned and, and things have changed a little. And uh, we now have zombies to deal with without the, uh, the help of the cannon. So um, there's quite a nice thing to think about there where the player's actions have changed, um, changed the scenario. Uh, but also created a different challenge and we talked about turning the thumpers off in a previous video um, turning the thumpers off basically uh, uh, brings the ant lines in and changes the changes the game essentially um, the combine and you now have the ant lines to deal with so this is a is a, a vehicle gate uh, as we call it we've, we've seen gating the player uh, the, the vehicle several times. It's actually a player gate, sorry, not a vehicle gate. What it's doing is it's basically saying you cannot proceed without the car because this toxic goo will kill you, but obviously in the car you're immune to it. So you need a decent stretch of toxic goo for the player to be able to not run through it without dying, uh, which is what this is providing. Um, and uh, and I've had to come up with... Uh, so in deep down... Uh, my, my original mod, which I'm redoing at the moment, um, I came up with a mechanic where the um, where the uh, uh, the car was able to take down combine force fields, um, and that allowed me to sort of gate the player and prevent them from moving forwards until um, they had the car with them. It was a way of making sure they always had the car with them. Um, and it was a bit clunky to be honest. I don't think I had really looked at episode 2 properly to see uh, what sort of gates there are. And really there are two gates for a vehicle if you're going to make a vehicle map. There is a jump gate because you can only you can jump much further with the car than you can anything else. And um, there is a uh, uh, the toxic goo gate and those are the two that I can really come up with. There may be others if someone knows please do post on here because I'm looking for other ways to stop the player from proceeding without the car. Um, and at this point we're getting told that we have a um, the tracking ability now to pick up these lambda caches um, which are going to be in, in lots of smart clever places um, and this is kind of just extending that lambda cache uh, concept from the original Half-Life 2 um, but I really love the way they've peppered these things all the way through the, uh, the landscape and that's certainly something that I'm going to be doing and I think this added a lot of replay value for me was finding these and the little mini games associated to obtaining all of them uh, to get the achievement at the end of it um, is something that I've tried to do in previous mods and not done so well at but uh, I think um, yeah this time uh, I'm going to do hopefully a lot better um, alright I'm going to stop ok so um, we are now heading out into uh, the wilds again 
Um, and we are going to be heading across this uh, vehicle gate to make sure you've got the vehicle with you, you've got the toxic goo as I said in the last one and, you know they've put lots of uh, bits and pieces for you to run over and so this is kind of improving of this lambda cache idea this radar you can see on the screen there is sort of adding to this concept of uh, alright I know shut up um, is the you know, this concept of stopping, investigating, finding things out. And you're not gated, once again. Alex is sort of recommending you do it, but she's not forcing you to. You could charge you all the way, all the way through this, or you can get out and, and start investigating. And so they give you... Every single one of these Lambda caches has a mini-game associated to it. And it's this mini-game concept that I keep coming back to that I love so much about Half-Life 2. So you just keep coming up with new combinations and ways of having fun. Um, so you can see you've got a zombie on the top, a couple of mini, uh, a couple of barrels which are normally physics props. You can pick them up and throw around, but these ones are embedded in the floor, so you can't move them, and they're fixed. Um, we can see the goodies inside, but how do we get to them? And I think that they're really just kind of giving you the concept. This is a little training puzzle almost. Um, and uh, there you go. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, Okay, so we can't get in there, but we can use the gravity again to fish stuff out, right? I think. I guess not. Um, i trying to remember. Hang on. Do that. Okay. Um, I'm making a bit of a hash of this, but you get the idea. Um, you can basically... And I think anything like this, where you can use the gravity gun and the physics engine to to just, you know, have the player fiddle around with stuff and, and, and get to things, I think that's really cool. Now, the other thing that I love about this area... Oh, what's going on here? We've got, uh, oh, we've got a zombie way off there. Alex is freaking out. It's miles away. You deal with him. Um, look at this. Behind these fences, so we blew that up, and I'm not sure if that explodes part of this fence or whether this was already exploded, but we've got sort of like... Yeah, it's basically a target range that's been set up for us to have fun with. Oh, hello. Um, and uh, this is, you know, just utterly pointless. It adds nothing. I don't know if there's an achievement associated to it. Um, or what have you, but let's find out. But they're, um, this to me is why, why the pistol's a bit of a bit of a cop out as I said in a previous video um, there you go no there's no achievement oh, unless it's that one no um, I'm gonna get killed as a result of playing around but all the way through this set this section um, there are little mini games set up which uh, you know are there for you to play with and just have fun with and it's fantastic and 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 so many, I mean, it's hard to build mods and stuff like that, but just to tinker around with physics props and that kind of thing and, and, and physics elements, you know, hanging things from strings and, and that kind of thing, is just had so much more fun. And hopefully they're all, you know, tiny little bits. And if you are a map maker, I recommend you just spend time at home just building little test areas and throwing in silly stuff like this. And next time you build a map, you can just put these bits in and just sort of stick them around the edges. And if players want to find them, they can. They just add so much replay value to these. To, um, I mean, episode two isn't isn't hugely long, but it's just filled with all these little great bits that that, that, that have kept me coming back and replaying it from time to time. And every time I play it, I have fun. Um, We're picking up something on the radar. I like this one. This is uh, another really good bet. Um, in fact, all of these little lambda caches are really nicely designed um, bits of gameplay. Okay. So, uh... <laughs> so that was quite cleverly done. I mean, obviously, we know that the, um, the, the floorboards may not be obvious to pick up um, the saw blade in obviously we know we can pick up saw blades uh, so we've already been taught that uh, and so they took a behaviour that we already knew oh wow I forgot how much stuff there is here um, they took a behaviour we already knew 
and uh, used it to guide us to something else. <laughs> That's a very funny line as well. Um, okay. I thought there was a way to get on the roof of this building. Maybe I'm wrong. Oh. So once again, I mean, I'm on e I'm, yeah, I'm playing this on easy after what I learned yesterday. I'm trying to do instructional videos with <laughs> the game set to hard, but um, the yeah, but even then, you know, these kind of areas are not dangerous. You're not really losing that much health. You're just having fun, and it's fantastic. I think one of the harder things is to figure out, well, you know, what kind of pickups can I give to the player? that aren't going to be... Obviously, if you're constantly giving the player health the whole time, which they do, really, in this game, there's so much health lying around, you're really never that much in danger of dying. But the health is still used as a uh, breadcrumb kind of pickup thing uh, for you to, to go exploring. Oh, there's one cache I didn't find. It's interesting. It's a lesson to be learned, though, about putting two caches together. Oh, is this a rocket launcher? Um, the... Uh, Um, so, so, yeah, like, for example, you know, here is health, and they're using it as a breadcrumb. They're saying, hey, you can jump in here, you can get in here. Um, this is genius. This this is absolutely fantastic, um, this particular one. For anyone who doesn't know how to do this or missed it, um, it's using the physics engine to, uh, you know, to, uh, in a completely different way. A way that we haven't really been able to see. And it's kind of similar to rocket jumping back in uh, the original Half Life uh, or Quake. Um, it's just using the recoil to, to throw you up. Got it. Um, and, you know, and the reward for figuring this out, because I think that does take quite. Yeah, you know, quite a lot is the rocket launcher, which is uh, not available in um, in uh, anywhere else. I think in episode two, I think this is the only place you can get it. So you know, it's quite a bonus. I think there's a hint, obviously, of it because you you see rocket launcher rockets back at the stash back there, but you don't have a rocket launcher, so it's kind of ball. There's definitely one around. I just don't know where it is. Okay. And, um, so yeah, as I say, the land, the casting they added really just sort of made that exploration bit, which may not have come naturally to everybody, uh, more of a natural part of the gameplay. I think, and Alex prompted me to do it. Okay, let's see where we end up now. Um, I'm trying to keep these videos a bit shorter, so we might end this one and, and start again in a second with the next section. The uh, here we go. So I mean, connecting your well, this is a good point to be made. Actually, we didn't talk about it half too, but connecting your levels together using tunnels the way we've been doing. There's a particular technique you can use to white out the uh, to white out the screen uh, until you get close to it um, so that you you know that you sort of have that daylight shining um, this is important because I said as I said before that's the same kind of tunnel um, look and feel that we saw from uh, Half-Life 2 maybe a bit more complex but what they've done is this is not a standard combine uh, door that can be opened because that might imply that the goal of this door is to open it. What they've done is you can see they've just used those those sort of combine uh, panels to say to absolutely block this off and say this is not the way we're going. I think signposting like that is really really important uh, to the uh, to the player. And this is quite a good one because you know we first pick up this lambda cache right down here, but it's actually on the on the, the switchback much further up. I think this is the one that's up in the trees. Well, maybe it's all the way over there. Maybe I'm wrong. I can be and am wrong from time to time. Um, I think 
What's that the way out? Definitely missed something. Um, I'm taking a look. I think this is the one that's hanging in the trees. I quite like this one. Or it might be the one in the cave. Oh, it's the one in the cave. So you can see, once again, we're snaking back and forth through a big environment, but the road itself is 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 snaking us back and forth and getting the most out of the the environment that they've designed. There's a little cave thing, like grotto thing in here. Um, I think yeah, here it is. Once again, gravity gunning. Um, dead bodies. I'm trying to remember if this is like sort of the hidden couple. Um, I've never actually found the the singing Vortigan in uh, in Half Life Two. So obviously this one they lead you straight to it by the nose, but. Um, Adding little bits like this into your maps can be fun. I mean, it depends on how many people play them. I've added hidden areas to my maps that no one has ever found, and that's a little disappointing um, because I made the mechanism to find them too obscure. No one's ever going to do it. Unless they knew it was there, they're not going to do it. So, um, you know, there are ways to, to signpost this stuff. Um, and, uh, and I think it's... Uh, it, it has to be quite unsubtle for them to make it. So, for example, you could have a video monitor showing an area of the map which they have not encountered before. It has to be a pretty big video monitor, but it's there, and you know you can show actually someone in it that might make a you know inquisitive player think, well, where the hell is that? You know, um, or, or you know anything like that. I'm not sure, but something to sort of guide the player to these areas if possible and try and make them fairly blatant. So before we get into this big fight and this extra scene, I'm going... Um, let's crack on. So we talked about obstructing, um, you know, obstructing the player using physics props and cars and stuff like that, and that's kind of what we've seen there. Uh, I mean, these are, these are a bit different just because you can just barge them out of the way. So um, I think that they're just to make slow the player's progress a little and also to you know, give him something to do. It's, it's quite fun to barge things out of the way. Um, this gets kind of weird because a lot of people have remarked, you know, we're kind of in the Oregon woods, Portland uh, kind of mountainous wooden thing and now suddenly we're, we're kind of at a Swiss cottage. It's, it's, it's such a strange combination, you know, I'm like Half-Life 2 is a... Uh, this is a hell of a fight, isn't it? Um, you know, Half of Two is, is it's kind of set in Eastern Europe, uh, City Seventeen. So, damn, it moved. Um, and then suddenly, you know, they're mixing all kinds of interesting locations and styles. I think this is probably the best example of a, a running or of a, a holdout battle. I guess it's a uh, waves. Of enemies that I've seen in Half-Life 2. Um, I mean, Half-Life 2, we had the, uh, as in the original game, we had a um, sort of Nova Prospect, and, and there's the whole section there where you set up the cannons and stuff like that. This is a fantastic example of opening up a play space as the action moves on, and um, at every area you move into of this uh, of this uh, of this battle, as, as you carry on. Uh, the the hunters start to make new paths and, and open up new spaces. Um, the uh, waves of combat. You God, kidding me? Right. Um, I really do need that gun. Um, <laughs> the uh, as as sort of different waves come in, they uh, they they open up new uh, new areas. Every area of the house you move into, it sort of triggers new behaviour outside the house and. The more you move around, the more difficult it becomes because you uh, you kind of uh, unlock different uh, teams that are going to start attacking the house. And uh, at certain point, once you've done a certain amount of damage to the the guys outside, the hunters decide to move in. And um, I think this is I think this battle misleads people as to what hunters should be useful and there's nothing wrong with it it's just you know they're sort of being used as mini bosses here um, whereas to me I think they, they work far better when uh, they are stalking the player and the player is trying to avoid being detected um, then we get this huge fantastic dramatic entrance here by the hunter that comes in through the door um, 
just sort of smashing the door down, if I remember correctly. So I think the natural reaction for the player is, you know, there's so much going on outside that it really does drive them down to the basement. Um, well. Um, and the, the scripting involved in this must be really, you know, quite complicated. I've never really gotten into it, but, you know, in terms of activating... Oh, here we go. So now I think the hunters are moving in. Um, and, uh, yeah, just to activate each wave and to activate, um, you know, a certain amount of... Uh, and ke to keep the pace of the battle going, I think, must be very difficult. Oh, here we go. Where are they? Oops. Okay. And also, the design of the house is clever because there aren't really that many safe spaces. You know, you saw Alex hiding in the kitchen there because it is kind of like a cubby hole. You can kind of hide under the stairs. But there's a... Oh! Those guys are bad. There you go, that's overkill, but never mind. Did that guy go upstairs? Ah, oh, here they come. So I've got one... Uh, alt fire on this AR2, which is going to come in handy. Well, okay, is this ridge going to burst in? Now that I've come back downstairs again for a second time, maybe not. Maybe they, you know, each one takes their turn to sort of do their big entry work. There you go. Bye bye. Um, and um. And I love the fact that, you know, she echoes exactly what the player's thinking. They know that the player's going to be having a tough time with these guys, and she's really feeding back and emulating what you're feeling, and that's really important. Oh, that was a bad idea. There he goes, down. Oh, it's your mate. Okay. Where'd you go? It's like in the kitchen. Um, it's too much. Let's get moving before they send more. So Alex is a, we've talked about this before, I think, is that Alex is a, a feedback device for the player. She emulates how the player feels, what the player is in, uh, is, is encountering, um, and she is continually sort of commenting on what's happening around you. And um, it's very, you know, it's tricky to do in a mod. If you can get it working, it works very, very well, and the player really does feel that they are experiencing Half-Life 2 again uh, um, because, as I say, having Alex um, providing that connection to the world and and basically anything you can do, as I said, I think, in an in a, a earlier video, to connect the player to the world is a good thing. Um, so, you know, you take an action and the world reacts. Um, and I think that's kind of the point of the term Valve was the... Uh, you know, and that kind of, uh, that bow symbol that, the, that, that they had when they started the games was the ability to dial up and dial down the world, to control um, the pace of action, to control the pace of gameplay. Um, um, as, as the game designer, um, you have the ability to dial things up or dial them back as much as you want to. Um, I think that was the original concept I heard that somewhere, I don't know if that's true. Um... But it's very true, and um, when you build your levels and maps and stuff like that, uh, you can sort of come up with some templating and mechanisms and con um, controls. As we said, so that entire encounter there was fully scripted, and things happened at the pace that the designer wanted. They didn't just throw a hundred combine at you um, in order to make that playing experience fun. It was necessary to to ration those those combine and to bring them in at different different paces and different combinations and uh, pretty much every combination of combine you encounter uh, combinations of combine anyway um you encountered were different and so uh, you know made made all of those encounters uh, more interesting okay so now we're back into um sort of slow pace picking our way through an environment as we said uh making your way through um Oh, struggling. Okay, super. Take that turret down, Gordon. I'd like to. Oh, fair enough. Um, 
And Alex, as I said, has lots of different um, reasons or, or mechanisms. Um, and here's one of them, which is that she is she's a key. And um, like any NPC can open up doorways um, in the game, and that means that the level designer can control the pace at which things happen. Um, as a game designer, that can be quite risky because, you know, for whatever reason, your level bugs out and Alex doesn't make it to this point, you're, you're then, essentially your level is completely broken. Um, so you kind of, then you're locked into this situation where your NPC or your, your critical NPC, the, you know, have to make sure that they can get everywhere they need to get to and, and um, I've certainly run into trouble with that. Um, Combine force fields, uh, obviously they're used all the way through, they're very useful for a level design because obviously it's a wall that you can turn on and off whenever you want to, you can shoot through it, Combine can move through it but the player can't, we talked about fences in a previous video, you can shoot through it, see through it but you can't move through it, um, well this Combine can move through so it allows you to feed Combine into the area without you having to, um, w without the player being able to escape which is very useful. The other thing is as well is that they turn on and off instantly. It's not like a door that closes that the player could take a physics prop and jam it into. Um, there's no way to stop these from closing and I think that's another important reason why uh, these are a very useful gameplay tool because the physics engine is, um, you know, is, is quite important. Okay, so we are um, looking for a way to get here. I think there's a ladder, yep. And, uh, and why padlock the ladder and have it fall? Because it's interesting. Um, if you could have just had a ladder. Um, maybe another reason for that. I'm trying to think. So you move into the space. It locks behind you. Alex talks to you. That distracts you. And then you sort of take a look around. And, uh, and, and then discover it. If the ladder were down, then you might have gone up and disappeared before Alex got to pass that information on to you. So... Um, it's about the player's attention and how long their attention span can focus on um, one thing versus another and if Alex is talking to you then you're probably not going to be looking around um, just a hint for players uh, these combine lights here I mean I build maps to build experiences for the player and I am not ashamed at all of coming of decompiling Valve's maps and looking at how they did things and in some cases, lifting things out of those maps and putting them into mine. Um, I'm a level designer, I'm not an environment artist. So, you know, and all of this stuff's here, I want to emulate a Half-Life 2 level. Obviously, I'm going to use the resources that are available to me. So, for example, this light, which is a, um, you know, a model and a, a light and a, or a spotlight and a... Uh, a beam, uh, EMV beam or something like that is fantastic. You can take this and you can light up any area and it looks fantastic. Um, I think that any new designer or new level level designer shouldn't fret about the fact that they feel like they have to come up with everything themselves. You should totally borrow from the environments, totally come from the, you know, take things out of these maps, decompile them, take stuff and then uh, and put it together in a new way, put it together in a new combination of, uh, of exp uh, to create a new experience. But I don't think there's anything wrong with um, with taking uh, some of the work out of this and reusing it in interesting ways. Essentially it's like if you think about it with a lot of games they have a, a sort of a, a level designer or I think Portal 2 and you think about the um, perpetual testing initiative that allows you to build levels out of um, you know you can paste them together in a very very simple editor which is really fun if anyone hasn't tried it I recommend it you can put together test chambers very very quickly um, but, you know, these are all pre-configured elements that you are just slamming together to create uh, some fun gameplay. I don't see any difference between that and grabbing a room, you know, grabbing this force field with these models and stuff and copying the whole lot and putting it into your map and using it in your own way. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. Um, the trick is, is to come up with something new and interesting. And if you can take these elements and combine them to create something new and interesting, then I think that's... Uh, that's very good. So I thought this was really good as well. Um, this is something I've always enjoyed. I can't 
I can't deactivate this while I've got the door closed because the ball will always end up back into the. Uh, this is a what they call a, a, a physics trap. I think it's called a physics trap. Anyway, it's a, um, a sort of a ball limiter thing. And no matter what I do, it will bounce around and end up back here. The only way to solve the puzzle is to open the door and punt the ball outside. In which case, uh, you win. But it's a really interesting, smart way of doing. Um, uh, of, a, of a new puzzle, a, a twist on, on a, fu a sort of a thing we already knew. You know, we, we've deactivated these uh, these charges lots of times, but we've never had to make sure the ball goes away, which I thought was a really clever new twist on it. Okay, so we've now deactivated um, our gate. So we can talk a bit about that just quickly. So we gated the player much further away, and we've had them come all the way back and explore an area that they might not have chosen to do so before. Um, they, we've then had, I mean, I'm not sure how long we've been in this, I'll look at the video in a minute, um, you know, I think probably 15, 20 minutes worth of gameplay out of an area that was relatively small, you could have just had this battle and moved on, um, but by having them come back up and re-explore this area again at the top, we've, uh, you know, you, you've gotten a lot more bang for your buck out of the area that you've created, and I think that's uh, quite a good idea, if possible having a player move through a space uh, several times um, is okay. I do struggle a little bit sometimes when, you know when you retread old ground, oh okay this is Look out below. <laughs> yeah. um, that's kind of an added bonus that jump there. Um, sorry the thing I was going to say is, is that you know having a thing like in Half-Life 2 where you uh, you get, you know when you teleport and it's a week later and suddenly you're back in the square again and you can see it all having been transformed and essentially you're repeating through the same space but it looks different and there's a different thing going on. Um, I think that's okay, I think you can kind of get away, it's done a lot to get you sort of more money's worth out of these, uh, out of these playing spaces. Um, if you can have something like that that we just did where basically, you know, you went past an area but you couldn't access it and then you sort of unlocked it a little bit later and I think that's quite good because it means the player's already seen it. The player's already seen the space before so they're kind of familiar with it but now it's kind of got a new uh, a new meaning. So this is a really good physics game as well where I think it's up there, yeah so it's hanging on a on a thing, I really like this one, in fact all of these as I say I really like but this one I thought was quite fun. Um, You know, I can knock this and knock these things out. Um, this is the perfect use of, you know, the physics. Uh, <laughs> put an arrow in the ground, but <laughs> I love it. It's so unsubtle. Uh, that's how unsubtle you need to be to help players find hidden stuff. Um, you know, I'll sit here all day. Um, I do wonder, obviously all these mini-games have a sort of a finite amount of time. I've tried to put some gameplay sections into my maps which are endless. You can keep playing for as long as you want to. Um, oh, I'm failing miserably. Oh, sort of. I've got the battery thing. Right, one more go and then I'll give up. Um, so yeah, it's kind of... Alright, two more goes. So one thing that players really enjoy doing is tidying up, uh, be it clearing all the zombies out of a level, um, me finishing that, finishing things, tidying things up. It's a bit like Tetris, getting rid of all of the blocks on the screen or worm, you know, like clearing off the screen, break out, getting rid of all the bricks. Um, that kind of behavior is something that players like to do and yet oddly none of us really like hoovering um, or tidying up our houses. Um, but um, the uh, but but that kind of behaviour is something you can really exploit as a as a level designer and um, give the player something to tidy up and to to play around with even if it has no consequence whatsoever um, putting the can in the bin at the beginning of the Far Five Two something like that um, yeah don't know why it's just in human nature to to put things where they belong sort things out. Um, putting the cable back in the wall, that kind of stuff. I think we're kind of into our final driving section now, um, and this is uh, before we head to uh, uh, to White Forest. So, um, 
And actually, most of this is story, I think, in most of this section, but we can still look up uh, some of these, uh, these these landscapes for these kind of driving sections, which are fantastic. Um, and actually, when you look at them, you can see the tree cards. It's really not that uh, advanced, but um, I think your eye just totally buys it, like the, the, the top of those uh, cliffs. And um, this kind of landscape was used recently for uh, the mod uh, Downfall, which is available on Steam, which is very, very good, and, um, and, and use this to great effect. And if you can decompile this and check out how it's done, it's actually it's really quite fulfilling to be able to do this stuff. Okay, so we're going to gate the player um, because we have a story section coming up, um, which is the return of Dog. Um, and, you know, Dog didn't really play a part in episode two until we got to here. And, you know, it's an epic comeback, definitely, uh, for Dog, with Dog versus Strider. And uh, I think we're all a big fan, but, um, you know, Dog as a character is a... Uh, he has, well, as a, as, a, as a gameplay thing, he's a... Uh, he, everything about Dog as a character is scripted in the game, so there's very little you can do with him, actually, in, in game. Uh, you can play fetch with him, and you can uh, race him in the car. And those are kind of your two real gameplay options. Um, as much as it's great, this entire fight is completely pre-animated, and it, it looks great. But it's uh, that's just how it is. And uh, I'd love it if if Dog had uh, more animations. So I'm seeing what I can do about that in my mod. But I definitely want to include him because he carries so much uh, so much affection. And if you can make sure that you're not <laughs> ripping out the strider brain. Fantastic. Um, you know, if you can make sure you're not messing with that in terms of that, that, that goodwill that comes with Dog. And I think that's what a lot of people had a problem with Hunt Down the Freeman with, was that they didn't really have that reverence and affection for, for the, the, the lore and the characters. And they pretty much ignored everything that was good about Half-Life or, 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 you know, this world that we know and these characters and these relationships. Um... I don't know, and just sort of ran roughshod over it. Um, um, one of the interesting things here, so, you know, we've been gated, dog's going to ungate us, so that's one thing that dog is good for, is, is, is ungating uh, driving sections like this, so I think that's probably something I'll use him for. Uh, as well as hefting this great big thing out of the way. Um, he's got some sort of pre-scripted animations that allow us to... Uh, that allow him to Looks pick stuff like up and leave it. Um, just the combination of dog and that's like a physics thing. So here dog is gating us, ready for the race, and so we can't go anywhere until dog starts. So he kind of gets a bit of a head start, which isn't fair. But it's this kind of our final swan song of driving uh, in this game. We can uh, run dog over if we're not careful. Um, you know, you can... Uh, really just put your foot down. And we talked about, you know, straight driving sections just not being very interesting. And so I think finally, you know, having us race dog back there is, is a, a, just a really cool way of just making it a lot more fun. And actually, it's quite hard. I've beaten him on many occasions, but I don't know if I'm going to do so today. Oh. And obviously, any areas where we don't want them to bring a vehicle, this is how we deal with that. We put in just a series of very simple posts, just like at the airport when you're trying to get onto a, an escalator with your luggage and it won't let you because you've got these posts here. It's a really simple mechanic. And uh, that concludes our driving section, apart from obviously the battle at the end where the car really comes into its own. Um, and I have to say that I think the battle at the end of episode two is 
you know, the pinnacle of everything that they achieved with Half-Life 2. Some people really hate it. They hate the Strider Busters. They hate the the hair, you know, the the manic thing of it. But in terms of design, that battle is very, very clever because, and I'm not going to go into it. I'm not going to play it. But what I will say is that uh, at the most basic level, it's Space Invaders. At the most basic level, you have Striders that you're moving towards the base, and as they get closer. Um, the the pressure builds and so and obviously and there are more of more of them that are added uh, towards the end and so that pressure on the player to you know you start off at a serene and if you think about space invaders you start off at a very slow pace a very serene level or think about tetris at the same thing very serene take your time enjoy yourself and then slowly but surely it gets faster and faster and faster and the as the striders get closer and closer to the base you know the the player has to has to really uh, really stop moving and, and stop being far more efficient with what they're doing, and it took me quite a few goes to to beat the battle even just on regular normal uh, hard uh, uh, difficulty mode, and so um, I think that's uh, it's very very difficult to pull off that kind of finale event, uh, and I haven't seen many. Um, many many mods being able to do that i think as part of the the mapping challenges there were some which were uh, uh on run shoot think live um no wrong think shoot live i should do that more often um the um basically you know that they've had a uh, various competitions where you are in a particular position you have to prepare your defenses and then the the the, the enemies come in and there were a few of those which really nailed that that ramping up of difficulty and got that pacing just right but the play testing must be um, must be very very difficult to do when you're trying to develop something that complex and that fun anyway so I think I'm going to wrap up here uh, I, I'm probably thinking about doing some other uh, videos in the next few days now while I'm in the mood and I'm doing a bit and then you probably won't hear from me again for quite a long time so hopefully there's enough information in these to, to really help people out and um, and we'll see about maybe doing some more critical gems soon as well over on uh, Run Things You Live, I'll speak to Philip. And um, I hope you enjoyed listening to this. And uh, yeah, speak soon. <laughs>